Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Madhu CS. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Robinhood. Uh, we are a financial services company. And I'm a tech lead for uh, this team or our called as container orchestration, which is responsible for uh, running all of compute at Robinhood. And uh, Robinhood has chosen Kubernetes as the compute platform of choice. So pretty much all of our compute, except for some legacy stuff, uh, is all on Kubernetes. Um, Today, I'll be talking about controllers and how we push the limits of the controllers. Uh, these are production war stories. Uh, but before I get into the details of the agenda, I want to say this. Um, I've prepared or we have prepared this talk to be a talk for people at all, all levels. Um, everybody is welcome. Uh, but that said, if you are an experienced cluster operator here, um, you might still, some of the overview concepts here might be a reputation for you, but we really hope that you can take some of these things home as an inspiration or to your a company back as an inspiration and pay a little bit more closer attention to some of these areas or um, maybe do, uh, I mean, revisit some of these concepts and see what is working and what is not. If you are a beginner, uh, there is definitely an overview in the beginning, but some of the specifics may go over the head, but that's okay. Um, uh, you don't have to take everything here, uh, but we still feel or hope that uh, it will give you a solid grounding uh, to the concept so that when you're ready to write your own controllers, um, you, you can use all these lessons or learnings. And hopefully it will, it will let open the hood a little bit and show the machinery inside so that you know how exactly these things work. Um, and coming back to the topic itself, um, nothing, Kubernetes controller pattern is a highly scalable pattern, right? We have seen how Kubernetes scales. Uh, but nothing is infinitely scalable, not even slash dev slash null, right? Um, so we, I'll talk about how we have push the limits of this pattern and the incidents or outages that we ran into when we tried to do that, the lessons we have learned from it, and um, what we are doing, how, how we solve those problems, and the ongoing work right now to uh, ensure that we don't, we don't run into these limits again and again. So I'll begin with a quick overview of, overview of controllers, and then we'll do two case studies. That's where I'll be spending most of my time. Um, one case study is about where we went too far, or when we hit the limits of the patterns. And we'll talk about the best practices or lessons learned. So this is the overview, right? Um, Kubernetes philosophy is you, the user of Kubernetes submits a, a declarative intent, as in they submit the intent of what they want the world to look like, which is called as the desired state. And then there are controllers reading this intent and taking action to bring the current state of the world to the declared state of the world. The controllers are constantly observing both states of the world, the absurd state of the world as it is in the intent store, which is the API server, I'll get to it in a bit. And then it's also observing the current state, and it's always, always trying to bring the current state of the world to the desired state of the world. I think the key concept here to remember is, it's always in that direction. The current state is always brought to match the desired state, not the other way around. If the desired state changes, controller does its work to bring the current state to the newer desired state, or if the current state changes for some reason because somebody went and did something manually in the infrastructure, it again tries to bring the current state to match the desired state. Uh, this is the key concept, and this is, this is the philosophy on which everything in Kubernetes is built. There is some documentation, uh, as in, there is official documentation around the concepts of controller. If you go look at the documentation, one of the interesting examples that it, it talks about, the classic example, is the example of a thermostat in the physical world, right? If you set the temperature of your thermostat to 70 degree Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit is constantly watching for or observing the temperature of the room. It does not immediately make the temperature 70 degree Fahrenheit in the room, but it's observing the temperature of the room, and every 
time it's not 70 degree Fahrenheit, it either turns on the heater to emit heat or the AC to cool down the room to bring the room temperature to 70 degree Fahrenheit. There is more about this analogy in the documentation. You can check out uh, the, the slide deck I shared, so you should have the link. But bringing this to Kubernetes world and to be more specific, um, Kubelet, although not a, not called a controller, the agent that run on the agents that run on Kubernetes nodes are controllers too. Although they are node agents, they are controllers too. They watch the API server, which is the intent store, to see if the kubelets have to run new pods and. If any pods get assigned to the node, um, those po and those pods aren't running on the node, the kubelet's job is to instruct the local container runtime on the node to start those new pods. So kubelets are, co are controllers too. Um, with that, we'll talk a little bit about the specifics of the implementation of a controller. This talks about the semantics of the controller. So far, we talked about the semantics of the API. We'll talk about the semantics of the controller. This is the actual machinery that we use today for writing controllers, right? Uh, if you go look at go, uh, client Go, which is the client library that's used for writing controllers, you, you may be using higher level libraries as well, like controller runtime or queue builder. But overall, they all depend on this machinery where um, when the controller starts up, it contacts the intent store or the API server to get the current desired state of the world, as in it tries to get the entire snapshot of the desired state of the world when it starts up uh, to make sure that it knows what the current desired state is. And this operation is a very expensive operation because when it does this list, it requires or it asks for the snapshot of the entire desired state of the world for all the resources it is interested in. Um, the key here, and this goes into where we push the limits, so I want, the one thing that I want all of you to remember is this listing operation is a very expensive operation. Um, so what controller does is, well, it can continue listing once in a while, periodically pull the API server or the intent store and keep getting the desired state of the world, but we have established that it's already an expensive operation, right? So you don't want to be doing often. So the machinery lets you use this API called as the watch API where the controllers can say, I now have the entire snapshot of the state of the world or the desired state of the world, and from now on, start giving me only the changes for the desired state of the world, which happens, let me use my mouse pointer here, give me a sec. So um, APIs, I mean, controller says, I have listed, give, from now on, give me watch events, which is the changes to the objects that I'm interested in or the resource I'm interested in. But that's not it, right? If it were only this, this pro for today's computers, it's not a big deal. We are replicating data here. Um, it's not really expensive. Um, but that said, controllers also have to do some additional work, right? As in, they are not just replicating or duplicating data or listing data from the API server. They do some real work for the change events or for the resources and then update the status back. Um, and the order of magnitude of resources every controller watches for is also very different. Um, there are some APIs or controllers where there are only order of hundreds of resources if you're talking about something like CRDs or something, the CRD controller is only watching for hundreds of resources. There can be thousands of resources or if you're thinking about things like pods, um, there can be half a million pods within a cluster because that's the scalability limit of Kubernetes in large clusters today, right? So if you are getting tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of pods and then doing some work on those pods, it gets really expensive if you keep polling all the time and going through all the pods all the time, even though if they haven't changed. So that's why we need this complex machinery of listing and then followed by watches. Uh, one other important thing to remember is Kubernetes API machinery does this, or the client API machinery does this so well that after it gets the snapshot, it can clearly instruct the API server to send all the events since that snapshot, the consistency is maintained in the sense that you are guaranteed or the controller is guaranteed to not miss any of the 
change as that happens to the resources since the list response was sent out. So these are the co key concepts. And here is a hilarious example that we have come across, right? Oh, one other thing that I did not introduce to was um, Kubernetes also has this concept of CRD, custom resource definitions, that, which is the key or the core foundation of the Kubernetes extensibility model. Uh, it lets you, the user of Kubernetes, to extend the Kubernetes the way you want to extend it. You can define your own APIs as a schema, and you can have your users use those schemas or APIs for getting something done. And in this hilarious example, um, oh, actually, even before I get there, I'm sorry. Um, you, you can define your own schemas, and then you can write your own controller, because schemas themselves, as we have seen, don't do anything, right? They just get stored, as an API resources just get stored in the intent store. You need a controller to take some action or do something on top of those APIs. So Kubernetes allows you to write those controllers as you want. And the interesting thing about Kubernetes is, it doesn't let you write your controller against just your own CRDs or APIs. It lets you write controllers against existing native APIs as well. And you can write controllers that cross the boundaries between your custom resource or custom APIs and the native APIs. And that leads to an extremely powerful pattern. So coming back to this hilarious example, there is a, uh, this is a real GitHub project, by the way. You can follow the link. There is this PISA controller. There are two CRDs here, PISA store CRD and PISA a order CRD. Um, I don't think anybody is opening a pizza store here, so I'm not going to talk about it. But we are all interested in eating pizza, right? So there is a pizza order CRD. Uh, what it does is, if you are interested in eating a pizza, if you want a pizza, you can go submit a pizza order resource to the API server where the CRD exists, and the controller makes the call to Domino's API to order a pizza. But unfortunately, that's all it can do today. It can't tell you whether you're full or not, or if you are satisfied with the pizza. We constantly keep hearing from the authors that that's coming in V2, but let's see when V2 happens. Um, but this talks about both CRDs and controllers. And taking this example a little bit, little bit further, you could conceive of writing your own controller that watches for new service accounts that get created in your Kubernetes cluster and order a complementary pizza for every new person who comes into the cluster. That's the extensibility power here. Um, with all this introduction, let's dive into one of our first case studies. Um, the title here is a little clickbaity, I would say, but hopefully it makes sense towards the end of this whole case study. Um, so I was on call a few months ago, and I got a bunch of alerts, and people started complaining that cron jobs could no longer resolve DNS. That was interesting, because anybody who has worked in infrastructure recognizes this sort of a page, right, or an alert, right? What is it about cron jobs and DNS? Like, why would DNS resolutions fail for cron jobs? Well, the real answer is it does not make any sense. There is no correlation. Like, if you're experienced, not experienced, it really does not make sense. So uh, we started digging deeper. Uh, I gathered around an incident response team. Uh, we started hearing from more and more application developers, backend service developers, that they were seeing this. And we quickly discovered why it was cron jobs. The thing was, it was not, not just cron jobs. Any new pod or any new workload that came up had this problem. And the actual problem was not even just DNS. Any new pod that came up would have a total network blackout for a few minutes, and then it would resolve itself. Uh, it was anywhere between two to 10 minutes, and no packets would go out. No pack I mean, packets would actually go out, but they would not come back in. The return path wasn't working. Uh, and the problem was the blackout time was typically longer than the readiness pro probes for most of these pods. The pods, so pods would constantly die or the containers would constantly die and come back up and it, they would see the problem again and this would happen over and over and over. Fortunately for us, running pods continue to work. This is the key thing or the uh, core tenet of Kubernetes container orchestration design. Even if there is a problem with your control plane, the programming of pods and everything, the data plane is supposed to continue to work, right? So the data plane was healthy, existing pods continue to work. We just couldn't do scaling operations or deploy new version of the software, thing, things like that. So fortunately, we did not have any customer impact. With that, I want to take a slight detour to introduce you to the networking stack that we run so that you can understand what happened here better. So we are a full AWS shop, uh, and 
we started our kubernetes journey about 4 years ago or a little longer than 4 years ago and we have been migrating all the services from raw ec2 vms to our self managed kubernetes clusters um, but we have we migrations are migrations are multi year efforts right so we we knew that we had to live in this world dual world where there was there were workloads on kubernetes and then there will be workloads in ec2 um, at the moment we have migrated pretty much all our stateless workloads onto kubernetes and there are there are only a few stateful workloads on um, ec2 but we still continue to live in this world so the solution that we have built i mean in the aws world if you want to do authentication or authorization, the easiest way to do, especially in the raw EC2 world, is to use AWS security groups, right? Um, security groups is essentially a network segmentation as a proxy for your authentication and authorization. It's a poor man's solution, but that's what we have. So we wanted to retain that for our Kubernetes workloads too. So what we built is, we built this uh, in-house component or system called Calico Cloud Controllers because our networking stack on Kubernetes is based on Calico. Um, so what this does, the Calico Cloud Controllers do is they read the security group configurations in AWS as in it periodically polls AWS, makes the describe uh, security groups and describe network interfaces call and it syncs that information into the Kubernetes clusters as in it creates the global network policy or network policy re custom resources in the cluster. Calico, which is, there is this component called as Typha here, but I'll get into that a little bit later. But overall, Calico, which runs the node agents, these node agents are essentially controllers as well. They're watching for these network policy resources. And every time a new pod comes in, it programs the IP tables on the local nodes to ensure that the security group rules are enforced at the IP tables layer, as in pods can either send packets or not send packets, depending on the IP tables rules configuration, but this IP tables rules configuration itself is a translation of our security groups configuration. So this is the networking stack we have, and this is how it looks like roughly, right? If pod A is allowed to talk to pod D, different application, the traffic can flow, otherwise the traffic cannot flow. Um, now let's, go with that introduction uh, or conceptual overview, let's get back to the incident itself, right? So as we spent time digging into things, we looked at all sorts of logs. Uh, we run a KHCNI plugin, which is responsible for doing IP acquisition for every pod that comes up and setting up the routes for the pods as, as the IPs are acquired and allocated or assigned to the pods. That is supposed to, as I said, supposed to do the uh, full route management for the pod, routing rules management for the pod, right? So we looked at CNI logs, we looked at uh, Calico logs to try to understand what was going on, and then we found this, I don't know if you all can read this, we found this really interesting log line in Calico node agent logs. Calico was saying this, removing old route, and it corresponded to the pods that just came up. That was interesting because what is an old route? Because these pods are brand new, very fresh, right? So the trigger was unclear, but we at least understood what was going on with Calico. So we put some mitigations in place so that we could open for market the following day. Uh, we, ha we also have a big st uh, stock brokerage product, right? Um, so uh, we put this mitigation so that it would give it would give us some more time to go root cause what was going on and fix the root cause. So we went on a root causing expedition, which was all about digging deeper and deeper into what was going on and a lot of code reading at the time already. That's how many of our incidents look like and that's going to be one of the lessons learned here. Um, so we looked at some of the dashboards and we have a really nice dashboard for all Calico operational metrics. And the first two things that we see when we open the dashboard is, this graph called as Typha ping latency and Typha's connection drop rate. Um, and Typha is this component that exists in the Calico ecosystem, uh, which acts as a middle layer or intermediate system that 
caches the updates in the API server and does connection pooling. And it does that because for large clusters like ours, thousands of nodes per cluster, if every Calico node agent is talking to the API server, API server just doesn't scale, it completely falls over. Um, so TIFA does both the caching and the pooling so that not every Calico agent has to go to the API server. Um, but Cal TIFO also some, uh, runs some periodic checks against the Calico node agents to make sure that the node agents are healthy. And one of the things it does is it sends ping requests often to the node agents to make sure that the node agents are fine. So we saw the ping latencies from the TIFA side go up. And if you look at this graph, the, the time at which it started going up perfectly correlated with the time the incident started. This is exactly when I started getting paged and people started complaining. So that was interesting. Um, so at this point, everything is point to Cali pointing to Calico being the problem, but we are not, still not sure what's up with Calico, so we start reading the Calico code. Uh, the other concern here is why now? We have handled much higher loads during previous Black Swan events. Um, we looked at port churn rate, we looked at security group change rate. There wasn't enough port churn rate or security group changes at the time, so it did not make sense. Uh, there is a part of work stream within the incident response group that's reading the code and trying to make sense of Calico Typha. There is this other group of people who are just looking at the metrics, and somebody comes across this graph, and this is the QPS rate for the service accounts graph. It's hard to come across this graph because you, Kubernetes has hundreds of resources or API types, right? You can't be building separate graphs for, it's just not practical to build separate graphs or panels for every single API type. And if you aggregate everything into a single panel, the problem is the rate of changes or the number of requests that flow through for pods is so high that it basically drowns everything else in the graph. Like every single other API request type will look like this um, zero line in that graph. So it's really hard to see what is going on with what API type. We have tried a bunch of things about with anomaly detection, but nothing has actually really worked for us. But we, we found this graph, and if you look at this, this is the service account mutation rate or the update rate. And this peak, there was a really sharp increase here. And this perfectly correlated again with when the incident started. And more interestingly, we saw this across all our production clusters. And then we started digging deeper and deeper, and we started pulling in or paging people in from various partner teams, the on-calls from various on-call teams. And then we realized that there was a potentially faulty change that was introduced to our in-house application development framework. And I'll take a minute to explain what our framework is. We have this framework called as Archetype, which is an abstraction that we provide for application teams to develop their applications, applications, backend services, whatever you want to use in, term in the lingo or terminology. Um, Archetype, we, we are completely bought into the Kubernetes style of APIs, the declarative modeling, declarative style of APIs, controllers, and everything. So Archetype are essentially a bunch of CRDs. We have, specifically, we have a CRD called as the application CRD, and we have a CRD called as the component CRD. And the idea here is that a given application is composed of a bunch of components. And there are controllers for each of these, and different components have different types of controllers and things like that. Um, so. What happened here exactly? As, as I said, each archetype application can have multiple components that usually, an application is composed of multiple components, right? Different server instances, worker daemon sets, et cetera. And there was a change to the component controllers that was pushed to add annotations to the Kubernetes native service account objects. And what this annotation was was the controller added a computed signature of the owning component to the service account, as in whatever component the service account was supposed to belong to, a, a, a signature was computed for the component, and that signature was added as an annotation, Kubernetes annotation, to the service account object. Interestingly and unfortunately, at that point in time, there was ongoing work. I mean, the ongoing work hadn't landed yet. A single service account could be shared by multiple components. We were working on or we were 
discussing, doing designs, or splitting that out. As in, we wanted to have one service account for component, but that work hadn't landed. So what happened was, and this is where the dueling in the introduction or the title comes in, right? The controllers ended up fighting with each other. One, one controller would come in and say, this is the owning component, and add the signature for it. Another controller would see that, no, that's not the owning component, and it would rewrite the signature. And this generated a significantly large number of update or mutation operations on the service account objects that it completely overwhelmed the system. And this is where things get really interesting. What do service accounts have anything to do with networking or anything, right? We, we were confused at the point, and then as we were reading the code, I mean, somebody on the team also knew about this, but we also realized at the point, this is, this is where all this incident response and interesting out war stories come in. Even though you theoretically know about things, it's hard to remember or recollect some of these things when you are in these high stress situations like incident, I mean, like these production incidents, right? Um, somebody realized that Kubernetes network policies also have this mode where Kubernetes implementations of network policies can program policies based on service accounts, and Calico does that. Unfortunately, there is no way in Calico, we, we don't use network service account based network policies at Robinhood, but unfortunately there is no way in Calico to tell Calico to not watch for service accounts. Even though we don't use it, it just continues watching for service accounts. So when the mutation rate started going up, Calico's in, in the happy state, it's not a problem at all because there are not as many mutations to service account objects. But in this unhappy state, it was a problem because Calico's in-memory controller queue, which is based on the Kubernetes client go machinery, got so backed up that it starved the important updates. And those important updates was new pod creation. Although Calico was not supposed to be doing any route management for us, the AWS KCNI was supposed to be doing the route management for us, there was a bug in Calico that did not read the configuration correctly. The configuration basically asked Calico not to do any route management, but the bug did not translate, I mean, did not let the configuration to translate correctly, and we hit that bug. And it's now a known bug in both AWS and uh, AWS CNI and Calico communities. So we have currently patched the bug in our local implementation, and there is some up upstream work going on right now. So Calico would still do the route management. It was tired of new pod updates, so it wouldn't know anything about the pods. CNI would come in do the IP assignments and all the IP management stuff, and then set up the routes. Calico, not knowing anything about these new pods, because it was so backed up, it would just go and delete the routes it wouldn't recognize. And that would cause a total network blackout for a few minutes. And then eventually Calico would catch up anywhere between two to 10 minutes, depending on the node and what else is going on the node. And the, route, the routes would come back and pods would, I mean, network would work again. So this is the first interesting incident, right? And I, I'll switch over to talk about the second incident, and I'll talk about all the lessons learned together in the end. Um, this is also another interesting incident. This happened uh, a while back. I don't rem exactly remember when. Um, we scaled up our systems in preparation for something. We, we scaled up our Kubernetes clusters and everything, applications, everything, for some something that we were anticipating. And, and then um, we did a production freeze. We said we were anticipating this event, so we are not going to roll out any new software. And then the event happened, and we wanted to scale down because it did not make sense to be at that scale and spend money. So we started scaling down all the backed up changes during the production freeze started going out, as in started getting deployed. And as we did this scale down, API servers started dying. Um, an API server would die, they would get restarted, stay healthy for a bit, and they would die again. And we were losing the control plane. And this is an interesting situation, right? Because some of our run books were based on running kube control commands when incidents happened. So, and because kube control has to talk to the API server to run the commands, and if the API server is dying, 
um, you are in a very difficult spot because you can't even get the basic information like what nodes are running, what pods are running, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we, we had other runbooks to go directly onto the nodes and look for things, and basically that's what we used. Um, but uh, we couldn't use a lot of our other runbooks. Again, fortunately, this goes back to the core Kubernetes standard, right? Control plane is down, the data plane should continue to function, so there was no customer impact again. Um, so uh, we continued doing what we did as, as in the previous incident or uh, case study. Interestingly also, we went to the API server was the problem. We went to the API server dashboard and these two are literally the first two graphs that we see on our API server dashboard is the CPU usage and memory usage. And again, same story, right? the moment where it starts going up, as in the CPU usage and uh, memory usage start going up, correlates with when the incident started. Um, so we had a bunch of theories. We started looking at logs again, like in the previous incident, and there was this particular log line in the API server logs, um, and again, we run self-managed because of these reasons, because we want to have access to these kinds of things during incidents. Um, and because it's our self-managed cluster, we have access to all these logs. So we went and started looking at these logs, and there was this lo particular log line. It said something about the audit buffer. This is for the audit logs that Kubernetes API server generates, right? This threw us off a little bit because this was a red herring. We thought, or we started thinking that we have an in-house implementation of the logging web, audit logging webhook that uh, ships the audit logs to our logging system. So we thought that implementation was buggy or something. There was some problem with the implementation and it wasn't receiving the audit logs. So that got backed up in memory in the API server. And API server, we, didn't, we started reading the API server code. I mean, I'm personally familiar with the API server code because back at Google, I worked on Kubernetes and control plane. So we started reading the Kubernetes API server code and we realized that Kubernetes API server does not do any circuit breaking when the audit webhooks don't behave properly or misbehave. Um, we had that theory, but that did not fly for long. We looked at, we were looking at kubelet logs. We saw a lot of config map secret mounting log lines in kubelet logs, but that was another theory that did not work out. And then, because the usage had increased in the API server, we said, well, let's, let's throw a little bit more money into the API servers, right? As in, make the API servers somewhat, as in the nodes, uh, larger than what they are right now. This is the cultural thing in the team. This is, uh, embiggened is the term that we use for these kinds of things. It comes from the Simpsons. Um, so we said, well, let's embiggen the API server and maybe it will make the problem go away for now. It did not make the problem go away, it made the problem less severe. As in, API servers were still dying, but not as frequently. And then we started looking into the API server logs again and again, and then we saw that we were getting this HTTP 410 errors in the API server. HTTP 410 gone is also a well-documented semantic in the Kubernetes documentation. I won't read out the entire thing, but the TLDR here is, actually even before the TLDR, a little bit of conceptual introduction, right? Um, when the controllers do a list and then followed by a watch, they have to get the watch events. So in order to send those watch events to all the controllers or clients, the API server keeps a watch of all the historical versions or changes so that it can send those changes to all the clients. And that is stored in a cache in the API server, as an in-memory cache in the API server called as the watch cache. Um, there is an argument or a debate whether it should be called watch cache or not and whether the name is a misnomer, but that aside, uh, there is a watch cache and if for some reason the API server is not able to send watch events before the objects are removed from the watch cache, uh, the API server gives up and sends a HTTP 410 gone error or error status code to the clients. And at that point, the clients are, as in clients including the controllers, are expected to restart their watches by doing a, a list operation, as in a relist. And remember what I said earlier, lists are super, super expensive. Um, so we were seeing four tens, and to give a little bit overview again, uh, pictorially, um, Kubernetes do a list op, I mean, controllers do a list operation on startup, and then they begin watching, and then API server returns the changes. Occasionally, API servers can say 410 gone, it's not a problem, uh, but if it starts happening frequently, it is a problem. 
And as we started looking at the Kubelet logs, it started becoming increasingly clear to us that the client in this case, or the controller in this case, was actually Kubelets. And because the control or clusters had thousands of nodes, thousands of Kubelets, right? Thousands of Kubelets were getting HTTP 4 time gone. And then they had to restart their watches by doing this expensive realist operation against the API server. So, and this, hap this actually happened when we were trying to either run large load tests or when we were trying to redeploy or update the versions of uh, larger services that we have. And because we were in this production freeze and then now we were in the top period, there was this bug that was introduced in our frameworks where the number of pods that were created for some of these larger services were in the order of thousands in a matter of minute. So this, our systems would create thousands of pods in a matter of minute. Oh my god, that's not good. I can do this later. Uh, and because the number of pods that were getting updated were so high, the watch cache would have a very high miss rate, as in things would go, the historical versions would go stale really, really, really quickly because they were getting updated, as in the versions were getting updated for given pods at a very high rate. And every client in this case, Kubelets were doing this, right? Thousands of Kubelets are now trying to, are getting 410 guns because the historical versions are not there in the API server and they miss their watch events. And every every Kubelet is trying to do a realist and followed by a watch. This further, further overloaded the API server and sent them in a, into a downward spiral and eventually to, to their deaths. So that's the two incidents here. Um, here are the takeaways, at least from, I mean, not from these two incidents. The takeaways are mostly from all the production outages or incidents that we have run into. Uh, hopefully, these are some inspiration for us. The number one takeaway for us is observability is the key to operational success. Uh, and there are three dimensions to observability, right? There are, there are metrics, logs, and in Kubernetes case, audit logs. I'll talk about all of them. I mean, there is tracing as well, but I won't get into tracing because um, the upstream support for tracing of Kubernetes components has not been great so far. There, there is a cap right now, and I know David Ashpole and other things are working on bringing tracing into Kubernetes components, but because at least at the time there was no prior art, we also haven't done a lot of work in terms of distributed tracing in the Kubernetes components or the extensions or controllers that we have written. Uh, we hope to do that. As, as the upstream work lands. Uh, so leaving that aside, metrics, right? Kubernetes components export a ton of metrics, tons and tons of them. Our lesson is scrape them all, because you never know which metrics you, you need. But that's it, though. It's not practical to build dashboards out of all those metrics, because there are just so many of them. If you put all of them, then your dashboards mean nothing. So. It's a little bit of a training or an exercise to understand what are the most meaningful graphs or panels that you want to put in the dashboard. In our case, having the type of pink latencies and the connection drop rates at the top for the first incident and the API server CPU and memory usage metrics as the top metrics on the API server dashboard really, really saved us because that was the first thing that we were seeing when we went to those dashboards. So structuring your dashboards in a way that makes these uh, kinds of important metrics more uh, visible or accessible is really important. And because you never know what you need, have an ability to construct these graphs ad hoc, right? If you're using Grafana, Grafana has a really nice way of building ad hoc graphs for all sorts of metrics. So if you're scraping everything, you should, you, you should be able to build these graphs ad hoc. Um, Coming to logs, logs from Kubernetes components are really useful, at least in our experience. But if you're reading the logs only from the log system without actually looking at the code, it's quite a feat as in these were the logs written by someone else, right? The author of the code by the developer. So you need to train yourself to understand what those logs mean, to understand what the system is. I, I think every, everybody, not Kubernetes, right? Everybody, everybody who has operational experience 
knows about this. So you got to train, at least our lesson learned here is we got to train our teams to make sure that they understand what these logs are for these particular components, as in that muzzle memory or, or that muzzle has to be built within the team. Uh, API server logs haven't been that useful for us. I mean, generally they're noisy and haven't been useful for us in practice. Don't, don't get me wrong, I have contributed to the API server myself. Um, so I understand how the code is written. Um, at least it feels to me like the API server logs are written for developers to debug the system than for the operators of the clusters. So we usually generally don't run to the API server logs as the first thing. Um, but, but that aside, having a good log querying and filtering system or the aggregating UI comes in really handy. Coming to audit logs, this is where I think uh, things are super helpful as far as API server is concerned. Kubernetes exports audit logs, right? And it fills the gaps left by the uh, debug logs that the API server provides. The audit logs haven't just helped with security stuff for us, it has also been an extremely powerful debugging tool. Um, it tells you who made the calls, how frequently were the calls made, and at what times. Uh, this is how we found that there were tons and tons of relists that were happening, and those relists were made by the kubeless during the second case study. And have a similar or same aggregating, querying, and filtering logging system or UI for audit logs as well, because it matters. You need to, you need to understand how these audit logs work, and you need to be able to filter these logs and view them during incidents. So that's the first takeaway. The second takeaway here is around change management and having some visibility around the changes that go into the system. Um, ensure that you have some way to or some visibility into all the changes that are pushed to, into your cluster. Your, it could be native Kubernetes cluster components, it could be extensions as in controllers or other things that you write. Um, and have some mechanism to have those notifications somewhere, as in all the change notifications. Uh, it could be a very simple system, just throwing out ideas here. It does not have to be this, but it could be as simple as notifications for a summary of changes that just rolled out. Put it on a Slack channel, but have a dedicated Slack channel where you can just go and scroll and see what happened. And have the ability to construct the timeline of changes because things generally break because something changed. If nothing changes, nothing breaks, right? Um, and the Kubernetes extensibility model, as I was saying, is very powerful, but it's also a double-edged sword. Uh, it's not just you or the Kubernetes operators who can write these extensions. Anybody who is using Kubernetes can write these extensions, right? And that means anybody who's writing these extensions can make mistakes. Uh, so ensure that you work closely with your partner teams who are writing these extensions, understand their use case, help them build similar systems as yours for change tracking so that you have visibility into them as well. And finally, this is really the last thing here. Um, don't be afraid to read the code. I think my, at least our personal, uh, our, I mean, the take here, or my personal take here is code does not lie, as in lie meaning there might be bugs in code, but when you read the code, you'll see the bug as well, as in if you're paying attention. Uh, documentation can be out of date or can have typos, a bunch of things, right? But Code is exactly what is running in your system. Make sure that you have the code. I mean, if you're running open source components at least, make sure you have your code checked out at the version that you're running. And don't be afraid to read the code. Um, Kubernetes is, lar is a very large code base. I understand that. I did some analysis of API server when I was back at Google. And it was already just the API machinery was around 1.1 or 1.2 million lines of code back then. This is excluding all the controllers and all the other pieces in Kubernetes. Um, so it's a large surface area. Not, not everybody will become an expert in everything in Kubernetes. It's just not practically possible. But try to, we, we have tried to do this, and my recommendation or advice would be to build expertise within each of these areas in, in your team. Uh, you could, the, the expertise, the areas could just follow the SIG model that the Kubernetes has. Um, SIG networking, you have a parallel analogous group within expertise group uh, uh, within, and is being raised. I'll wrap up. This is the last slide. Um, 
So yeah, build expertise, make sure that people in those areas are familiar with the code for the components that they own, both internal and open source. And then also ensure that there are debugging tools. I mean, people within those groups are comfortable with the debugging groups, uh, debugging tools within that area, TCP dump, IP, et cetera, for networking, P prof, flame graphs, et cetera, et cetera, for all components. Um, with that, uh, that's the end of my talk, thank you. Um, I went three minutes over, but I'm also happy to take questions. I'll be around, or if people have questions here, I'm happy to answer now as well.